everyone. Welcome to National Entrepreneurship Week's Everyday Entrepreneur Speaker Series. I'm really excited to be here today with what I would not consider an everyday entrepreneur, just an exceptional entrepreneur, Alex Fielding. So um, Alex, you want to say a quick hello, then I'll dive into your bio and we'll get going. Hi, Amber. I am absolutely an everyday entrepreneur. I promise nothing special here. So thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I'm sure viewers and listeners will think differently a little bit whenever I read this impressive bio. So as CEO and chairman of Privateer Space, Alex Fielding is responsible for supporting the leadership, vision, and execution of the company. Privateer, co-founded by Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak and MacArthur genius Dr. Moriba Ja, is focused on space set, safety, sustainability, and intelligence. Fielding held engineering leadership roles at Cisco, Apple, and Exodus. He co-founded GPS company Wheels of Zeus with Apple's co-founder Steve Wozniak in 2001, which sold in 2006. Alex was Chief Technology Officer at Power Assure and then Vice President at Vigilant before starting Ripcord while a contractor at NASA working for the CTO. Alex was CEO at Ripcord from 2014 to 2021 and remains on the Board of Directors. Alex is on the Board of Directors of the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education and the Mentor Board of Orange Fab and an advisor to Astrospace and iRocket. So, Whew, that was a, that's a bio, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, well, I think we, we, we're going to have to work on, you know, condensing that down to like one sentence. <laughs> I feel like it's always so funny because we get entrepreneurs and they have these incre incredible bios and you want to share all the work that you do. But um, we have like 20, 25 minutes max to talk about all of this. So I think our first question is about your entrepreneurial journey. What, what what led to this? There's so many things. Um, so I know it's going to be hard. That could be a 30 minute conversation itself, but kind of where'd you, where'd you go and how'd you get to where you are today? You know, I, I think curious people just remain curious. And, um, you know, when you, when you ask yourself questions and you don't have good answers or where the dogma uh, exists so strongly that the common response is, well, of course we know, we're almost always wrong. And uh, I, I think challenging the status quo and dogmatic thinking, which is kind of living with the result of someone else's thinking, uh, maybe older thinking, it may have been right in the moment, may have changed over time. Those are things I always look at in terms of what, what do I want to do that makes meaning and purpose in my own life so that I'm never bored. And I haven't been bored in a day in my life because I'm always working on something that will probably not be solved in my lifetime. Um, so some of those challenges that really get me excited, when, when we built Ripcord, we started with the challenge of where is the total knowledge of human history and how do we connect it to everyone in the world so that it's searchable and accessible to a broad range of people. So we can, we can start the next generation with all of the knowledge that my generation was missing, right? I mean, I grew up pretty broke and my family had a version of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was the version of the internet. <laughs> And it was missing volumes. So there's certain things. Don't ask me questions about biology. I just can't tell you. Um, <laughs> but this, this idea of we must do those things. When, when we started Ripcord, we asked ourselves, how would you make the world paperless? And how would you solve that problem using technology that we'd started developing at NASA? Um, so we ended up building giant vision-guided industrial robots that could digitize the world's books and papers and libraries and and works and make them searchable and accessible online. So we, we've uh, we've had a great run there. The company is in fantastic shape and hopefully going public soon. And um, you know that problem set is so big, it, it probably won't get solved in my lifetime, which makes me very happy that we've made a dent and we're continuing to make one. When we started Ripcord, uh, when Waz and I did Wheels of Zeus, our GPS locator company like 20 years ago, half of the satellites on orbit in space were dead satellites. And we used to joke with each other, you know, and it really was a joke 20 years ago because we didn't know about debris. We just knew about dead satellites. We used to joke, maybe someday we'd be the world's first space sanitation engineers and we'd ride on the back of the trash truck and we'd toss these dead satellites <laughs> into the compactor. But, you know, like all great jokes, there's always some, you know, morsel of truth. And 20 years later, uh, Steve called and said, hey, I'm really interested in cleaning up space. How do we do it? And we began by building kind of the, the Google Maps or the ways of space to try to be able to help eliminate and uh, remove risk in orbit. So 
orbital space flight? How do we make sure we don't crash into each other? How do we make sure that that is a free service? We shouldn't be charging people to not crash in space. That sounds like a pretty horrible business model, <laughs> uh, but it has been a business model in space in the past. So we're, we're trying to disrupt and upend that. And how do we get enough precision so that we can rendezvous in space so that we can dock one space vehicle with another? So, and that can enable things like refueling and a path to us becoming a truly spacefaring civilization. How do we get not just to the moon, but to Mars and beyond? Uh, I have a, a three and a half year old daughter that tells me every night that she wants to go to space and that she wants to drive the rocket and that she's willing to take me and mommy with her when she <laughs> drives the rocket to the moon. And I, I want that for her really, really bad. But if we don't start solving these hard challenges now, we'll be too late. We'll miss this opportunity. Uh, and we could, we could actually damage the space domain the way that we've damaged the earth domain in, in the sense that we've, we've, we've certainly had an impact on our climate that's not a positive one. Uh, and in the space domain, we've also made an impact in the space domain that's not a positive one. We have to begin to correct that as quickly as we can because the growth is just accelerating exponentially. Yeah, I mean, there's so many nuggets of, of just learning in this introductory process. Like you went from company to company, you really just stayed curious the whole way. I also love that you just casually mentioned that Apple's co-founder, Steve, calls you up <laughs> and says, hey, let's start this business. <laughs> like, that's awesome. And it, it, that it came from this just longstanding joke that you all had had made. Um, and I think that it's jokes really do identify problems um, in, in their own way. So I think for somebody like me who has no knowledge of anything to do with space technology or anything like that, let's talk a little bit about privateer space and you kind of given it's the ways of space. Yeah. Explain it to me in layman's terms. You can use a demo, however you want to like showcase what exactly do you do and what do you provide as part of your business? Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to share a little bit about uh, Privateer and Wayfinder. So Wayfinder, uh, if you go to privateer.com, you land in an application that we call Wayfinder, which is a nod to the, the traditional Hawaiian wayfinding um, tradition of navigating the oceans using the stars. And where you are in Wayfinder kind of guesses based on your IP address. It knows that we're headquartered in, in Hawaii. We're in Maui in the research and tech um, community. We're actually in the economic development uh, board building here. And if we go to please look up, what it's going to do is guess where you're at. And it's going to zoom in over your location and show you all the satellites actively and in real time that are overhead. Now, if, mm. I, if I click on legend, I can turn on the rocket bodies that are remaining and I can turn on the debris. Now you get a more picture, a more kind of precise picture of what's over our airspace. Um, all of these objects, you can paint their orbit. You can download their ephemeris data, the OEM files that show you the live tracking of the objects. Um, you can look at that. Here's the, the high resolution um, SP vectors. So this is the, the actual um, tracking information for the Starlink satellite in, in real time. And you know this, this gets interesting and I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the, the kind of public facing side of this. This gets more and more interesting as we have more data that goes across domains. I mean, you know, Earth is this holistic ecosystem that really goes from the, the bottom of our oceans all the way up to lunar space mm -hmm. and beyond. And what you're looking at here, all the teal dots are active satellites, all the pink, purple, gray, and other dots or rocket bodies, debris. And now you get a much bigger picture, right? If, if we took all the active satellites that we're tracking, so 7,100 and change, and then we just turn on debris that we're tracking, which is 11,700, there's more trash than there are active things in space. Can I ask uh, a dumb question before we, before, how do you, how do you identify the debris? Like, is that public available information? Like how, how is that I imagine trying to map the debris of the ocean, for instance, and that would seem insurmountable. So I guess, how does that work? It's a really great question because we're we're not particularly, we as the, 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 the royal we as the space community are not great at tracking space. And the way that we do it um, are, are really three or four things. One are onboard transponders, similar to the transponder that's on an airplane that tells us where it is. 
we have those in some satellites, but there's no requirement that all satellites have transponders, even though there is a requirement that all planes have transponders. So consider this one of the failings of an evolving community that's just exponentially growing faster than, than the standards. Uh, the other way that we do it is using phase array from the ground. So we basically use radar, but instead of looking sideways, we're looking up at the sky. And we do that kind of glancing the sky plus or minus 40 degrees while objects fly overhead. Uh, then at Privateer, we have an exclusive worldwide partnership with Celestron telescopes. So we can dynamically task the Celestron network, which is the, the largest network of participatory citizen astronomer telescopes, to look at objects in the sky. Mm -hmm. So you get, instead of having you know 20 or 50 telescopes, you have a thousand telescopes looking for things that are not other planets, but are looking for things that are debris, satellites, um, and, and other things floating around our near-Earth environment, or, or really our Earth environment between here and the moon. Um, the other thing that, that we, we see people doing is using um, basically radar reflectors or laser um, reflectors and range finding on their satellites so that we can look at those objects. Now, the problem with all these approaches is we're not very good at seeing things smaller than 10 centimeters. So if it's smaller than a softball, this would be the equivalent of asking air traffic control to tell planes when there's pigeons nearby, right? Mm. <laughs> they can see the plane. They, they can't necessarily make out the, the individual pigeons. Mm -hmm. and it's the same thing for space where we're looking at lowered space and, and up into, you know, these fastest moving objects in relation to the earth. They're doing 17,000 plus miles an hour. So a satellite that's over your house right now will be back over your house in an hour and a half, the same satellite, just to kind of put that in perspective. Yeah. And people think of, of space as something where it's very, very far away, but you know, you and I, from a distance perspective, are farther away than you are to lower its space. That is, I think people don't realize how low lower Earth orbit is, but we're really talking about satellite assets that are largely operating between a few hundred kilometers up and a couple thousand kilometers up. I mean, before we get to geostationary, which is higher. But these objects that are at highest risk are, are happening there. One of the things that Wayfinder does is it combines the satellites with Earth observing imaging. So if I keep zooming in, you get kind of Google Earth. So as mm. I get closer to the ground, we're getting different satellite imagery at different resolutions. Uh, this is actually our, our island headquarters here in Maui. So this is where I'm sitting uh, at the moment. And every location on the map can be used through an Amazon Location Service API call to build apps that combine the perspective of the Earth, the maritime traffic. Uh, soon we're adding air traffic, mm. weather, um, space traffic, and then space weather into this perspective from Leo to Mio to Geo all the way to, to, to the moon. And you know, again, if I turn on the rocket bodies and debris, this is all live data. So all these little dots, you can click on these and and they're moving. And they're moving. As a matter of fact, if we if we zoom in, um, it doesn't look like they're moving, but they're moving. So uh, there there they go, right? Yeah, I mean they're moving pretty <laughs> pretty quick <laughs> to your point. Yeah. And you know this is this is important because we can see the the tracking data, and we can even download the ephemeris data. So we can download that that tracking data directly off the website. One of the services we provide is this thing we call the crow's nest. Crow's Nest looks at the top 20 objects in space that are going to be the most likely by 3D probability to become conjoined. So it doesn't mean crash. It just means they're going to come very close to each other. Could be intentional. They could be docking. Uh, they, they may be flying together like Starlinks often do. And, or it could be something here, like where we have um, the second highest risk uh, thing here by 3D probability at, at this second is this piece of debris with this other satellite. Now we can zoom to that conjunction, so we can now model and the time clock fast forwards to when it will occur, and we can simulate when will these two objects come closest to each other. And the, the other thing that we can do in this in Crow's Nest is if you're one of the people operating and you need to develop a maneuver plan or use our maneuver planning to get out of the way, you can view the conjunction data message, which has the telemetry for both objects uh, included here. So here's the debris, which obviously can't move the debris. Um, here's DL, you know, D2, um, Atlacom 1. So they can certainly maneuver. 
Mm -hmm. You can just click the button, download the conjunction data message and get out of harm's way um, at no cost. Now, if you want to operate a constellation doing this, we have an API service for this that you can get off of Amazon and we get paid a very small fee. It's, it's you know, pennies per, uh, per maneuver to keep you out of harm's way um, by and large. But this is gonna become more and more important because the space domain and our earth domain are totally connected, right? I mean, what goes up will come down. Uh, soon we're gonna have many tens of thousands of things, you know, in the very near future, in the next five years, we're gonna have probably 10,000 things that are gonna be re-entering. Those 10,000 plus things that are planned to re-enter, they're gonna, little bits of them will survive their, their uh, reorbit, so their re-entry. So you're gonna have pieces of debris that will, we know kind of how much is gonna survive. We know morbidity and mortality rates on re-entry. Are they gonna cross commercial air traffic mm -hmm. as an example? What's the risk to planes from pieces of fragments of dead satellites re-entering intentionally? Um, will any of that debris land on the White House lawn? Right. Uh, I, mean, I don't wanna doomsday, I'm kind of an optimist, but we have to at least understand the risk profile of the connection between earth and aviation and space and maritime so that we can start to understand these risks and threats while we figure out how to operate more safely in the environment. So, so Wayfinder is an interdomain data fusion platform that connects these domains in a way that developers and real people can learn about space, um, but also in a way that you know, we can use this to build a safer operating environment. Uh, we're also doing things here that are kind of cool, like tracking the space station. So you can you can Absolutely. maneuver around Wayfinder and take a look at uh, it's already on her current path over ground. You can also get her her live tracking data and uh, download that. You can also track things like debris. So we can look at uh, debris from the the uh, the Russian Cosmos fourteen oh eight uh, ASAT attack back in November of twenty one. Um, here's the, the pieces of debris. And this is, again, it's all live data. These all have NORAD IDs. They all have MPL IDs. I'm just clicking kind of around just to pick some random objects. Oh, <clears throat> we, can, we can then click here and paint their orbits so we can see where are they going. And we can model and simulate. So you can hit the fast forward button on the Omega clock to see where will these pieces of debris be going. And, you know, these are a hazard to everybody operating in the environment. And we have to be really aware of how these things and you know this is from a single anti-satellite maneuver right yeah there's plenty of things that crash in space that we don't even see and the problem you know one of the scariest things is and i i always kind of take it home to why does this matter to me um i i wouldn't i wouldn't buy my three and a half year old daughter a ticket to space right now nor would i go with her yeah uh, not, not based on this risk profile, because, you know, you think about a nine millimeter bullet, that's probably the wrong analogy, but you think about that bullet and its impact, you know, M MV squared, still MV squared, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is we're now dealing with the same mass, but we're dealing with velocity that instead of, you know, going a kilometer a second is going eight kilometers a second, or yeah, actually I mean, bullets whew. aren't even that fast, right? So, so you're talking about something that's 10 times the speed of a bullet, that's a fragment, many cases that we can't see because we can't see the million plus things that are smaller than a softball uh, in, in, in near its base yeah. whizzing around over our head. That's a very scary big problem that we must solve if we're going to become spacefaring. And it's, it's why it matters to us that we get this right and that we make a difference. Yeah, this is um, just wild to me. First off, my dad was really big Armageddon fan. And so I'm like, <laughs> okay, at least we can map falling debris a little bit more. <laughs> But also to your point, like space frontier is kind of viewed as this untapped potential, but it's not safe untapped potential right now. Um, and so I, I, I love the idea and how you're framing it as, you know, this is a huge problem, but it's also an opportunity for us. That's what we encourage all entrepreneurs to do is transition from problem to opportunity quickly. So I want to talk a little bit about um, maybe for just advice in general and how you've overcome certain things for other entrepreneurs that might be listening in. And I'd, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what your biggest challenges or failures have been in your entrepreneurial journey and how you overcame those. Uh, and they don't have to necessarily be around privateer, but and just in your journey, journey in general. So would love for you to talk a little bit about that mindset. You know, I, I think 
there, there's kind of this, this adage that most young companies are more likely to die of indigestion than starvation. Meaning that if you really have found that, that product market fit, if you found that need in the world that you must fulfill, um, my, my advice is always make it a mission because people who are aligned with a mission will, will stay together because the mission means so much to them. You know, our, our mission at what we're doing at Privateer, we know that our odds of success are against us, but we must do this in our hearts because this is something that we feel we must make an impact on. Now, product market fits there. Scaling is really hard. Execution is really hard. Ideas are really easy. Everybody has a great idea for how they could make the world a better place. Making it a business, whoo, tough. <laughs> whole other uh, level. <laughs> it's a whole other level. And, you know, now if you really love that, I, I think there's people, I am somebody who I love building. I love that race to get from no revenue to a hundred million. That's, that's my thing. Now past that, I'm probably the wrong guy. Once a company gets to a hundred million in run rate, there's someone else that is probably got that mindset that knows how to optimize. I'm really kind of a builder problem solver type of a CEO. So I love chaos. I love my day-to-day -day, uh, insanity of, of problem solving and working within a team so that we can all kind of contribute to how we, we micro pivot the company into the right direction so that we can get to that flow. Thinking about scaling challenges early solves a lot of headaches later mm. because if the business does well, and in privateer's case, we've been very lucky and we've also done a lot of very, very hard work. I mean, our, our engineering team and, and it really everyone in the company is working their hearts out to push the company forward as fast as we can. Scaling it is not going to be easy um, when you have things that are in an environment that are both unknown customers in our case, you know, what are those problems? We have nation states, um, companies around the world, how we interact and solve those problems from a United States perspective, being a Hawaiian company. Um, location and locality does still somewhat matter, not as much before COVID, but mm -hmm. certainly still matters. So thinking about scaling, um, you know, I've fallen into this trap a whole host of times where you are convinced we solved a problem, we found a need, we filled it, we got great customers, they're happy. We can use them as reference cases to build our business with other customers. We've got that, that proof that we've delivered great value and solutions. But for entrepreneurs, I think one of the lenses that, that we all have to wear is that of, of venture capital if you need funding to go faster, right? If you don't need venture capital because there's nobody chasing you down the hall or you have all the time, you don't need it. But if you do, the perspective I would walk in the door with is that 90% of venture funded companies fail and 80% of those fail within 18 months. So your odds are actually better at starting a successful restaurant uh, than starting a successful technology startup. Now, if you look at that from just a statistic standpoint, what does it mean? No startup company should ever win. <laughs> Statistically, <laughs> uh, it's very improbable that, that companies win and disrupt the market. So now why is that? The incumbents are incredibly well-funded. They own the customer base. They've owned them probably for some time to have such a huge market share. And now you're coming in with a tiny fraction of the money and resources and people. And you're actually trying to disrupt something that is the status quo with something more innovative. Mm. The, the theme is, it's not about us versus them ever, right? I, I think that's, you, if you walk in the door with, with that mindset, it, it becomes pervasive. If you start to do it, it's us versus them outside the company. You start to see that inside the company. You know, I learned mm -hmm. this lesson a long time ago. You you don't want sales versus marketing versus engineering versus ops, right? You want 100%. everyone on the same team. Yes. Um, but this is this is a set of challenges and a set of kind of a mindset of okay, if if we do everything right, and we're one of the fifteen percent of those companies that survives the first eighteen months then how do we become part of the, the, the 10% that make it to the, the long game? We actually get a chance to deliver and make a real impact uh, in the world. That should be more about impact because if you're doing something valuable and you're making a huge impact, the revenue and the money will absolutely follow. Right? There's a, a market there 
chomping at the bit. Delivering the value and getting to that stage is incredibly important. And I, I think it's why companies raising Series Bs, if they have those metrics, have a much easier time than companies starting up with that leap of faith that we are going to go do something to disrupt industries. So I, I, I think um, thinking about scaling on day one is really important. I think thinking about what will allow you to outpace and outmaneuver and um, survive in industries that are well-established. If you're not first mover, if you're not making a new industry, if you're actually disrupting an existing industry, mm. what makes that so compelling that it, it must be done? And there's there's great examples, but I think those are those are the things that I would say uh, I have not always done a great job at and are things that still need a lot of help from a lot of ideas. You know, we, when I look around the table at Privateer, we are um, a, a total melting pot of cultures, um, you know, gender identities. We're a, a mix of people with different backgrounds, different cultures, different thinking. And that's what makes great young companies great. If, if you look around the table and everybody looks and thinks like you, you've done something wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. I think that that segues actually perfectly to my next question. So National Entrepreneurship Week is really about building America's ecosystem to support entrepreneurs, whether you want to be a small business owner or you want to get into that just innovative startup tech kind of world. And you talked about this, like you have an, a robust ecosystem within your company. I'm just curious about how, how you have engaged with larger ecosystem support. Like what, what have your partnerships looked like to make all of your efforts possible? You, you know, partnerships, I don't, I don't think you can understate the value of great partners because, it, you know, doing startup companies is a team sport within the company, right? you you have to be able to pass the ball and trust wherever and, and whoever that goes to, to do, to do the right thing. But uh, outside the company with external partners, you know, you're building capability together. In Privateer's case, the Wayfinder technology that I showed you is a platform. And, you know, we also have some satellite bus infrastructure that we're building uh, with partners as well. There's no way you can do it all yourself. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. uh, world's too big if the problem is that big that you can solve it completely with a small group of people in a small office then it's not a big enough problem um right so I love that. Go, you know go after something bigger um, i'm gonna but, make a t-shirt of that, <laughs> of that. <laughs> but i think that's the illusion right the illusion is um especially for first-time entrepreneurs it's such a leap of faith mm -hmm. and i think that there's a um, resilience is probably the number one factor for building startups because you're going to get punched in the face over and over again. And it, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen. It's just how fast are you going to get up again when it happens? Mm -hmm. Because you're all you're all doing the same thing together. It's not you alone. You're, you're getting punched in the face with an entire team of people who yeah. are going through the same thing. So I, I think I think that's incredibly um, important that that you're resilient and that you understand the odds are against you, but you cannot be afraid of failing because I don't know anyone who's ever won anything that was afraid of failing, mm -hmm. right? Or, yeah. or, or you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't start, right? right. <laughs> I've, met, I've met some people that are afraid of winning, but I've never met anybody <laughs> who's a winner that actually is afraid of, say, uh, of failing. So I, I think those are, those are really important traits and it's something that you you end up interviewing for and picking your your comrades and your teammates because you're going to be if you're successful you're going to spend more time with your work family than you will with your real life family just by the nature of building the company right mm -hmm. yeah i think that's so important and so it's like this idea that you are nurturing your internal ecosystem you're building your external ecosystem and together you are picking really resilient people and partners to, to work with you. Okay. Well, this, this has been, you've been full of just great tidbits for entrepreneurs. So I think my last question is just going to be really focused on one final piece of advice. Like if you had to pick one thing to say to an entrepreneur, that's perspective, they're just getting started in any entrepreneurial endeavor, what would that be? Well, I married a therapist and that helped quite a lot. Um, <laughs> so, so your advice is to marry a therapist. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. 
she certainly hasn't cured me, but it's it's been very <laughs> helpful. Um, but I, I I think it's just be be cautious and careful of of who your teammates are and who it's it's really about people and it's about capability and personality types. Mm. And I, I think um, you know building Ripcord, looking back after seven years of starting that that company at NASA, getting to look at a much larger company where the bulk of us as co-founders uh, that started that together on that endeavor, the bulk of us are still there. I mean, I'm even still there kind of in spirit. I'm on the board and still kind of an employee and adjunct. But if you look at that founding team seven years later, you know, 80% of that small group are all still within the company and we're all in different roles. Everybody's job changed from day one. So I, I think there has to be kind of this, my, my advice would really be to, to pick your partners really, really well, because you're, you know, you're, you're rowing mates. Um, Admiral McRaven probably said it best, but you know, it's not just make your bed. It's pick your paddling partners really, really well, because the people that are in that boat with you, pardon the privateer <laughs> metaphors here. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's incredibly important and, you know, and, and just embrace um, the, the differences and the different ideas, because that chaos is what makes great young companies great, right? If everybody in the room is saying the same thing, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. The people mm -hmm. who are saying that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Keep them. <laughs> absolutely, right? Yeah. That's, that, that's the most valuable piece because it challenges that team dynamic and it's teams that build great companies. I, I'm pretty sure you could take a team of any really brilliant, wonderful young company that is doing great. And you could say, you know what? You're going to run a coffee shop and they would still kill it. They would do great. Yeah, it would be the most innovative coffee shop ever. That's right. You know, ca cafe and space um, yeah. coming soon. But I this is, it. but yeah, it's all it's all about teams and people and having the capability and the talent and and the ability to disagree at a collegiate level, disagree with ideas, not people, right? Mm -hmm. If and challenge that constantly. It it might seem annoying uh, to some people where they're like, well, God, there's always that person that's saying this is this is the wrong direction. Those are the people that, you know, you got to honor. And it's it's those ideas that you have to put on the table and say, what if they're right? Are we, yeah. you know, are we, are we challenging our own dogma? Is what we learned last year true this year? It's it's going to evolve. And um, I would just say that's that's my number one thing is just make sure you you pick great teammates and that they pick you. Because it's a yeah. it is a team sport. Oh, I appreciate that so much. And I I hope that. The folks that are listening or watching are really taking that to heart and you know it's something we talk about all the time it's not an independent individual endeavor entrepreneurship it is a team sport pick your people right um so alex i gotta thank you so much for being with us i want to just give you an opportunity if people are interested in learning more about privateer or any of your work is there how can they connect with um, what you're doing Absolutely. I mean, go to uh, privateer.com um, or mission.privateer.com if you're interested in kind of more of the inner workings of the company, reaching out, job openings. We're always hiring. Uh, that's a great place to interact. We're we're kind of smattered across social media. So, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, you, you name it, wherever it is, you can find us and we're pretty responsive. We've got a fantastic team there. Awesome. But, you know, always feel free to reach out. And if it's if it's ever if you ever need to reach me, I'm insanely reachable. So LinkedIn always works very, very well. But uh, definitely would love love help, would love participation, would love more partnerships. So if space is an interesting domain or if you have data to contribute or data you'd like to share, we're totally open. Perfect. I am so excited. I'm going to go like just explore. <laughs> That's my follow-up. My husband's going to be like, Amber, please stop playing with that space platform. And I'm like, I can't. <laughs> That's awesome. I would yeah. love that. That's awesome. But thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And we are so excited to share um, your story with our listeners. So thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.